Surrounded on all sides by the Pacific Ocean, locals and visitors alike agree that Vancouver Island is one of a kind. From bees to beers to flowers to food, I'm off to explore another hidden gem on our gem of an island, the Greater Victoria Flavor Trail. I love exploring the Saanich Peninsula, and one of my favorite stops to make is Country Bee Honey Farm. This little farm began in 2015 when the owners decided to give up their big city life to purchase this 11 acre property. The farm includes a large store, beautiful walking gardens, colorful beehives, and so many animals that kids and adults love to visit. Well, we've got animals. We've got <laughs> a brood. goats, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, goats and pregnant sheep. <laughs> we've got peacocks and ducks and chickens. Do they, they have names? People. These are my okay. kids' goats. Rosie and Spirit Mint. And Mint. Yeah, and then Wookie. That's Cookie and Wookie. <laughs> Those guys don't have names, but they're just, just these, the cute ones do. Just the cute ones yeah. have names. Yeah. People come from all over to see these cuties and also visit their farm store for local delicacies. And honey, of course. We've got, yeah, a whole store full of all sorts of all kinds of bee products you have, like honey, and what else do you have in there? We've got honey, pollen, propolis. Propolis is a resin that bees collect from trees. They also have beeswax candles, treats, and even honey on tap, where you can fill your own jar. Speaking of bees, I'm ready to get all geared up and meet the stars of this little honey farm. We're gonna take the bees out of this hive and we're gonna move them into our observation hive that okay. we're gonna then install into our tree. Show me the way. All right, well, Let's we're gonna see. start by lighting a smoker. Okay. Um, and this just keeps the bees um, calm, basically, and that stops them from being able to communicate with one another. And then what do you do with the smoke? What, how does that work? We're gonna, we're gonna puff, puff the bees. We're gonna smoke gotta, the bees. We're gonna smoke the bees. Yeah. <laughs> so like steaks, but living. It's just like a steak. Bees communicate with pheromones, which are kind of like perfumes. By using the smoker, you stop that communication between them so that they can't warn the other bees that someone is in their hive. So it keeps them from moving around and being too active and... No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> just, okay, so they're gonna be everywhere. It, they're gonna be everywhere. That's... It, it just stops them from telling each other that you're in the hive, basically. Okay. Yeah, so it keeps them calm. Okay. Yeah. Can I put my hood on? Uh, you can put your hood okay, on. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> I feel like I want that on. And on goes the armor, because safety first. I'm just wondering how scary this is gonna be for it's me. It's not gonna be that scary. Okay, okay. No. <laughs> this is gonna be a good experience. Thank you. As long as you don't get stuck. <laughs> Too many times. Lindsay starts by smoking the front of the hive, and the smoke goes through the colony to calm them all down. We open up the hive and... This is a pollen patty. Okay. So they eat this, it helps them to feed the baby bees. So that's bag. like their initial food you give them to kind of get them started? Yeah, it's a supplement. So okay. it just encourages them to build up. B vitamins. Yes, B vitamins. <laughs> vitamin <D. laughs> so do you want to hold this frame? Uh, so you can hold it? Do I answer truthfully? Uh, no, you have to do it. Okay, thank you. Really thank you for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you hold it with your yeah. hands like this. Okay. Underneath those little ears. Yeah, there. okay. That's all capped honey. So once the moisture content of the honey gets low enough, okay. the bees, it's, it's considered ripe and then the bees cap it. And then those are all worker bees on there. Okay. How so can they you, all sting you. How can you? <laughs> thank you. All of them will. Thank you at once, simultaneously. <laughs> how can you tell the difference? So worker bees have like little eyes on top of their heads and drones have big long eyes down their face. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they're. Like the yeah. screen movie. Yeah, exactly. The worker bees are transferred over to the observation hive, and Lindsay shows me the lady that all the buzz is about. The queen's on here. So how, do you, she, how do you know? She's right there. Oh, she's the big one. Yeah. She moves differently. She has like these big thunder thighs that plow through the bees. <laughs> but you can kind of see like her legs are different. They're kind of like spider legs, they remind me of. Yeah. They're like furry and they're thick like. Yeah, as yeah. opposed to, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I see. She is the most important part of this whole colony. Yeah. Because without her, the colony can't develop. Yeah. So, like, her day is spent laying eggs. And see, there's, like, little yeah. white grains of rice. Yeah. Those are eggs. Yeah, those are eggs, okay. Yeah. And so, she just lays eggs all day, Yeah. all night. That's all she does. 
The queen goes into the middle of the hive and the next frame is pulled where we find. Those are all capped baby bees. Right These here. ones in yeah. here? Yeah. Okay. So those are all capped and then inside of the cell you can see little white grubby yeah. things and those are larvae. So they oh, go from an egg yeah. to a larvae to a capped cell. Yeah. And how long does that take after they're capped to become bees? So females are 21 days. And, uh, okay. Queens are 16 days and drones are 21 days. And you can see on this side, this is all... I do this. Oh, uh, does this make this move away from your hand? Yeah. That's so cool. And then, so those are all capped. That's like a magic babies. trick. Lindsay is like Houdini. And with every frame, I learn something new. That yeah. is pollen from flowers. Okay. Yeah. And they take that yeah. and they mix it with honey and it turns into bee bread. The bees take that and they eat it and then they secrete royal jelly to feed the babies. I think our little friends are ready for their new home. We place the first part of the observation hive into the tree, essentially stacking it from the bottom up. And then this is the most important one because this has the queen in it. Okay. I feel like you don't trust me with that. I don't. Which, yeah, it's Wes. <laughs> in goes the queen. We secure the hive in place, put the top on, and voila. Just like that. There we go. There we go. And we have an observation hive. Yeah. Cool. So people can come and check out the bees in action in the tree all summer. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bees. What beautiful creatures. This little brewery with big flavor was started by Michael Kuzik, who has his doctorate in both microbiology and chemistry. After leading several world-class research labs, he decided it was time to shake things up and begin experimenting with a 50-liter pilot brew batch. They now make over 25 beers and have a great tasting room where both locals and tourists can enjoy every one of them. Applying science to beer is what Category 12 was all about. And Michael starts our tour with a little lab experiment. So what do we have going on here? Uh, we're gonna replate uh, one of our yeast strains. So we've got a library of about 30 different yeasts in the brewery that allow our beers to all taste very different. We use a different strain for every yeast. Okay. And so we need to keep them alive, kind of like a sourdough starter. So we're gonna light up our Bunsen burner. And what we have here is a loop. We're gonna get this red hot. And this uh, just kills anything on it. And then we're gonna cool okay. it down so it doesn't kill our new yeast on this new plate. So that's just like a blank plate with nothing in it there? Exactly, okay. it's totally sterile. And these are the yeast from the old plate that we're gonna re-streak. And we come over here. And so you're like picking it up from the old one and onto that one? Exactly. Ah, and so okay. now, the reason we streak it out is you end up with like single cells separated. Okay. And then those all grow up into an individual colony, so it's a pure culture. Oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah, so they really are like little starters. These little microorganisms are responsible for the fermentation of the beer and metabolize the sugars extracted from the grains into alcohol. The next step in my beer education is carbonation. We want to check the carbonation level okay. on this beer. We're about to package it and can it today. Okay. The reason we do this is twofold. One is to make sure that it handles well on the packaging equipment. The other is carbon dioxide adds acidity to a beer. So you want to have just the right level for the style so that okay. you're not overpowering the, the flavor of the malt and the hops. So we use this little device here um, and we're going to hook this up to the tank. I'm going to fill it up. And then I'm going to get you to shake out the carbonation. So we've got two dials on this device. Okay. Temperature and pressure. Once it's filled, yep. we're going to pull out a piston and that allows the CO2 to escape into a, a void. I'm going to crack it a bit, let it fill. It's got a little sight glass at the top here, so we'll be able to see when it's full. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're starting to hit the beer. We get the, all the bubbles out. There's the beer. You're wasting beer. It's so you get numb to it real fast. Aww. So now we're full. Okay. 20 psi. You got a little piston down here. I'm going to open that up. And now I'm gonna hand that to you, and you're gonna just shake that up and down for about a minute, as hard as you can For go. a minute? Yeah, we're gonna get all that carbonation out. Does anyone else feel like he's just having fun with me? A minute is a lot of shaking. You're doing perfect. <laughs> okay, we can pause and, and, and check here. Okay, what are we looking for? I am going to just read the pressure. We're about 15 PSI, pistons all the way out. Shake that a bit more, we're just gonna make sure the pressure doesn't go up any longer. Okay. What numbers do we have there? I've got 13 PSI and 38 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Okay, that's got us at 2.67 volumes. All right, so that means we're good to go, ready to drink beer? It's in the range we need. Perfect, and I hear we have work to do. Let's go do it. All right, let's roll. With the carbonation levels where they should be, we head over to the mill. Okay, so over here we've got our mill, and we're gonna crush our barley for the next brew. Okay. So here we've got about 20 bags of malts that we need for each brew. And okay. we hoist each bag up into the hopper on the mill here. And when he says we, he really means me. The bags of malted barley are emptied into the mill where it's crushed and then conveyed into the big hopper above the brew house where it makes beer. And that, my friends, is science. Hmm, that's great. And suddenly I find myself in a field of flowers. This is Longview Farms on the beautiful Saanich Peninsula. Before they became Longview, the farm was a flower farm for over 50 years. The current owners kept the daffodils and they also began organic vegetable production. Today, they're the largest certified organic vegetable farm on Vancouver Island. And before we get into the vegetables, let's talk about your kind of most iconic thing in these beautiful fields of daffodils. Daffodils you really can't beat. It's, uh, it's one of the only flowers that actually can come up as early as mid-January and pretty much the only place in, in Canada where you can have flowers that early in the middle of winter. So how do you harvest them? Yeah, so here's a, here's a knife, I'll show you. Thank you. So you don't actually want to harvest them once they've flowered. If you okay. harvest them once they've flowered, they won't last very long in storage. And we oh, ship sense. our uh, flowers all over the coastal, the west coast. Yep. So what you want is, you can, if you look right here, you can see. Okay. This flower, it hasn't opened yet. So you can see there's the top uh, part here, which is called mm -hmm. the cap. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is to harvest the flower before um, it's opened, but when the cap up here is full. Because sometimes when they're not ready yet, you'll see the cap, it'll actually like bend a bit at the top because uh, okay. it's not quite full yet. Okay. And, yeah. then, and then that's just really just to enable it to be like more sturdy in storage and then slowly bloom before the customer gets it. Yeah, exactly. If you hold it at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, yep. it will not bloom. You can hold it for two to three weeks. And then as Amazing. soon as the customer puts it in a vase at room temperature, it'll bloom in about two days. And then it should last in a vase for about a week. From flowers to food, something I know a bit more about. Beautiful succulent kale tops. Not, no, we're not looking at the leaves, which are great but the tops. Tell me about the tops and what's, what, what's their deal? Uh, a lot of people don't know this about kale, but it's actually a biennial plant, which means it takes two years to grow. So the first year it'll come up and you'll get the kale leaves, which is what you often find in the grocery stores. Yep. But if you let it overwinter in your soil, it'll come up in the springtime and it'll produce what's called kale tops. And it's actually a flower, the flower of the kale. Okay. But if you harvest it before it blooms by just breaking it off here, yep. you can harvest it the same way you'd harvest asparagus. And it's ah. you know, like a shoot that you can then cook and make all sorts of fun things with. And that's why it's so like kind of succulent and sweet and fiery, because it's that like new, fresh, bright growth. Exactly, yeah. When uh, when kale goes through a frost, it actually gets sweeter. But because of the frost, it breaks down the, the cell walls and yeah, just okay. makes it a little bit more succulent. So I'm going to eat this. <laughs> mm. It's spicy. It is spicy, but it's so good and fresh and like, mm -hmm. It's like rapini, but way better. Yeah, well, it's actually in the same family as broccoli and rapini, so that's why okay. oftentimes people will make mistakes when they're looking at it in the field. How do you harvest it properly? Because it feels like it would take a long time to get all this picked. Yeah, so it's actually pretty fast. You just bend over and you kind of follow it down till you stop seeing the sprouts. So okay. here's a natural stopping point, and then you just okay. snap. Let's give it a snap. Yeah. All right, it's like a, just like asparagus, eh? Yep, exactly like asparagus. So and all then, of this is hand harvested? Everything. Everything you sell is hand harvested. Yeah. That is a ton of work. Oh yeah. Despite the work that goes into harvesting, these little kale tops are totally worth it. From the fields to greenhouses, we go check out their vegetable starters. The greenhouse itself is three and a half acres with 10 compartments. Strawberries are grown on a concrete pad and the rest of the rooms use in-ground crops, which means they're actually grown in the soil. We have baby arugula right in front of you. Right there. And then to your right, you've got some radishes. Baby arugula is just coming up. Is it ready to eat? Can I have some of this? Oh yeah, you can have some right now. Awesome. Oh. Mm. With certified organic farming, some natural herbicides can be used, but not after the crop has emerged. So weed control becomes a labor of love. Show me how to use this thing. 
yeah, so it's a, it's pretty simple. So it's called a Dutch hoe um, and you just take it and you go in between the rows and gently scuff up the surface. Don't worry if you hit the plants. They actually don't mind a little bit of a brush every now and again. A little friction. All right. There I can right. go on this side over here. Go for it. That is a lot faster than doing it completely by hand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you have to do this? The ideal is to only have to do it maximum one time and then hopefully you've planted it dense enough that the leaves will actually take over the bed and uh, outcompete the weeds. What's your favorite crop here, Emily? Uh, well, I personally love the greenhouse crops because they take a little bit more love and care. You have to prune and tie them and care for them, but you get just amazing production from them. Plus, they're beautiful and delicious. Thank you so much for taking the time to show us your incredibly beautiful and productive farm, Emily. Yeah, thank you so much for coming out, but uh, don't forget you still have quite a bit of weeding to do before you leave. Oh yeah. All right, I'm on it. The last stop on this flavor trail experience is Nourish Kitchen and Cafe, which resides in an old 1888 heritage house. The two levels offer a restaurant, cafe, and culinary market, providing tasty but healthy fare. They boast various rooms for parties and all sorts of celebrations. I, of course, was there for one thing, the food. Hi, welcome to the kitchen. Today we're gonna to be making you a few dishes. Our first course is our cashew cheese seedy bread and ferments plate. So this is the seedy bread that we make in-house. And we're just gonna pop the seedy bread in the oven. And start plating up all of our pickles and ferments. So the dips on this plate are the cashew cheese, which has the black garlic, and dill in it this week. So here is the zoog sauce. And I'm gonna start putting the ferments on the plate. They make various ferments in house, including sauerkraut, local turnips fermented with rose and hibiscus, and carrots fermented with dill and garlic. These are black radishes. Um, they're super cool, really gorgeous. And they keep their color super nicely in a ferment. She adds kimchi made with pineapple juice instead of fish sauce, shallots pickled with hibiscus and beets, and a few sprouts to complete the rainbow. We have our beautiful candy cane beets. Can't forget about those. And these beautiful ro flowering rosemary are from our garden. So we'll put some of that on the plate. And the final touch, the fresh baked seedy bread. There you have it, our cashew cheese seedy bread and ferments plate. It's time to dine with Haley Rosenberg. Thanks, Amira. So what we sample some of this food, I mean, tell me about Nourish. It's a bit of become a kind of a bastion in Victoria. Aww, um, thanks. So tell me about it, yeah. A big part about Nourish really is that the food is such a huge part of communicating a lifestyle of health and wellness and happiness and joy and connection. And so the space that I wanted, I wanted to be mm -hmm. able to like have the lifestyle around the kitchen. So we have the rooms upstairs, the botanical bar and the, the cafe. People could come and just grab a drink if they wanted to and go, or they could come and sit and dine if they wanted to. Kind of like going to grandma's house. So on the idea of food that's nourishing, like what here is nourishing on the plate? What, how is this helping us? Essentially what we try to do when we're making a plate is to take comfort food that mm -hmm. we, we may know and remember mm -hmm. and to twist it to have as much nutrients and flavor and deliciousness as possible. Mm -hmm. There's black garlic in there. Tons of ferments. Ferments are such a great way to preserve seasonal food, bring flavor, add probiotics. They're just gorgeous. They smell funky. They're fun. So you can just kind of play with this dish. Now we're gonna start prepping our golden Benny. So instead of um, English muffins, we use these beautiful sweet potatoes as our base. So I'm just gonna start prepping these. We like to try and take classic dishes that people are really comfortable with um, and turn them into a more healthy version, but showing people that they can still be delicious. So to prep the sweet potatoes, so we put a little bit of turmeric on the wedges. Black pepper helps your body absorb the anti-inflammatory properties. And then toss them. So once those are looking coated, we're gonna get them in the oven. While the yams cook, seasonal veg are cut and seasoned, following the yams into the oven. Then comes the color with local baby greens and a stunning garnish, candy cane beet. So I love to put this type of stuff on plates because I feel like it 
shows that we put love into our food and who wouldn't be happy getting one of these on their plate. <laughs> this healthy vegan Benny uses cashew cheese instead of the traditional hollandaise, flavored with black garlic which they've dehydrated in house. Add some beautiful poached eggs and we're ready to assemble. Okay, so now we are gonna plate our half and half Benny and pancakes and then a full size Benny. We're gonna put some maple syrup on the plate where the pancake is gonna sit, as well as some of our cherry blossom syrup that we made this week. A pancake goes on top of the syrup. A bed of caramelized yams for the Benny and a bed of greens. Add an apple and rhubarb compote for the pancakes. And of course, the eggs. And then our hollandaise sauce, which is made with the cashews. On top of the hollandaise goes local sprouts, in-house made cherry blossom whipped cream, ground pumpkin seeds, and fresh cherry blossoms. All right, and there you have it. We have our golden Benny and our half and half. I don't know about you, but my mouth is watering. These are two dishes that have been on the menu for probably eight years, and I think if we took them off, it mm -hmm. wouldn't be good. <laughs> In fact, we tried to, and it's not good. So I know it the is. answer to that. It's super good. It is really good. Yeah. Yeah. The cherry blossoms in there are perfect. Cherry blossoms, when you cook them um, in syrup, they actually become like a nutty kind of almond-like flavor mm. rather than a floral flavor at all. So that's incredible. It is. I thought that was coming cool. from something else. Mm -mm. I mean, that's actually ultimate cherry blossoms. Yeah. Wow. We're just on the cusp of getting the bounty of the season. These peas are from um, a farmer on the peninsula as well, who just does pea shoots. That's his thing. So even now, like, not when people would traditionally think about when Vancouver Adams flourishing, you're still it's like, flourishing enough for like all a the time. bountiful full play, right? Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, there's so much innovation happening too, and mm -hmm. as more restaurants buy local produce, mm -hmm. there's more demand for farmers to figure mm -hmm. out how to. Yeah, the more people buy, the more like money for infrastructure there is. Absolutely. Right, and the more farmers can do and their ability just increases, right? Yeah, which is why it's so important for us all to support this system. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Well, Haley, thank you so much for taking the time to teach us about Nourish and how Nourish you really are here and tell us your story. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Well, that's the end of this flavor trail, and I can honestly say I feel nourished.